So I made it a point to call Aretha, said Luther Vandross, because I knew how close she was to Cecil and I wanted to express my sympathy. But Riri was lunching. <laughs> Well, hello there, love bucks. Hello, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And if you are not a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on YouTube. And for a small $5 monthly fee, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before YouTube gets it, if YouTube gets it. Now let's talk about uh, David Ritz, Respect the Life of Aretha Franklin. Uh, I don't know what uh, chapter this is. We left off. Aretha Franklin's sister, Carolyn, had just passed from cancer. Okay. And her sister in law, Erlene, Cecil's wife, was explaining to David Ritz that her husband is now in the throes of a. Erlene said that when it comes down to Aretha and her sister, they fought like cats and dogs, but because. Aretha held her brother in such high regard, in the same regard that she held her uh, father. Her brother could do no wrong in her eyes. Now, Erlene said, screw all that. Uh, Cecil, you need to get your ass in rehab. If you don't get in rehab, brother, then I'm out, okay? And that was the only reason as to why he uh, decided to put himself in. Keep in mind now, now, keep in mind, Cecil, the brother, is the manager of Aretha Franklin. If there are signs of addiction, Aretha Franklin don't see it, nor do she care, you know. And um, quite frankly, Cecil continued to do his job, even though he was in the throes of addiction. Now, David Ritz visited Cecil in Detroit just before his rehab. He spoke a great deal about his friends who had been crushed by crack. I knew Marvin Gaye was on the pipe, he said, because he told me to stay away from it. Marvin's whole history with drugs was a cautionary tale. He also mentioned David Ruffin, you know, the lead singer of The Temptations, the first one. Hey, I want to put David Ruffin up there with uh, among the greatest male singers, you know, him, Donnie Hathaway, you know. But anyway, let's move on. David Ruffin was struggling with a crack cocaine addiction that in a few years would take his life. Cecil discussed how he, his father, and his siblings had all operated in a world of stimulus. Now, again, I'm quite confused when it comes to Aretha. They had mentioned before that Aretha had had some substance abuse issues. Uh, I could see her using marijuana, but you know, I don't think that's, I mean, I don't know. Like the smokers say, that's just the earth. Weed is earth. You can't count that as a drug, okay? If it's legal, that shit, well, no, because alcohol is legal too, okay? And that will kill the fuck out of you, okay? They were very, or they are being very evasive about what drugs that the other people Franklin family members did outside of Cecil. Cecil was just flat out, I was hitting the pipe. Per. I ain't trying to sugarcoat shit. I was on the pipe. I went to rehab and I came back. Ruth Bowman goes on to say that she was so proud of Cecil. Cecil was her protege, one of the smartest people that she had ever known. So you can imagine how much I hated seeing him get lost in all those drugs. When he got clean, I rejoiced. But then when Earlene called to say that they found a spot on his lungs, I fell apart. 
I was just devastated and I could only imagine what this would do to Aretha, but Aretha did not fall now, apart. Let's not forget how Aretha deal with her pain. She deal with her pain through song, okay? Or to pick somebody, pick something petty with that somebody and just go in on them, you know, relentlessly, okay? To be super duper uber petty on something, to become fixated on something so petty so then that way she can't deal with whatever emotions she's dealing with. Or the third thing that she does to deal with her pain is to throw herself a big grand pump. Now, how she dealt with uh, the pain of possibly losing her brother, Sisu, was to throw a grand Ray ball. You know, she had to call Jet. Jet, I'm getting ready to throw a ball, put it in the papers or whatever that is so these Negroes can come, right? But she threw a grand masquerade ball. She was beautiful. They said she was pretty sexy. She was doing her thing. She was dressed as an Egyptian queen with Willie Wilkerson, her long-term boyfriend, uh, who was a firefighter and a veteran by her side, dressed as an old time convict. Moving okay. forward, Aretha had promised her old friends, Ahmed Aretigan and Jerry Wexler, that she would appear in the Atlantic's uh, 40th anniversary at Madison Square Garden. Okay. Aretigan putting the zhuzh on over here. You got to come, baby. Everybody who is somebody is coming to this event. Okay, all the people who were responsible for putting Atlantic on the map, and that would be you, Riri. I know you ain't with Atlantic no more. You round there to Earth so with Clive Davis. But don't forget where you came from, girl. Not Columbia. We ain't going to bring Columbia up. But we talk about us. We gave you some hits too, baby. So we need for you to come and participate. Riri said, sure. I'll do it. I'll do it. You know she didn't show. OK, she didn't show. It was a big smack in the face to Atlantic. But I don't even know why they asked her. You know, I mean, maybe they was just being nice. Riri, will you come? Yeah, I come. You know how you ask people will they come, but you still know in your spirit that the motherfucker's not going to come. That's why I'm like, I don't even know why they even put it in their heart. I mean, you asked to be polite, but why did you even believe Rita was featured on PBS? PBS is PBS. How do you even get to PBS now in the era of uh, cable? Because remember back in the day, you had two knobs on the TV, okay? That one at the bottom was for like ABC, NBC, um, uh, uh, what is that? CBS, okay? And all the other big channels that was sub CBS, sub NBC, sub ABC, right? And then you had Channel 5, that was like for the local stuff, right? But then like at the top, that's where you got to like the, the numbers like that would be where you could see Zoom, Electric Company, uh, Masterpiece Theater, Benny Hill, uh, Absolutely Fabulous, PBS stuff. I don't even know how you get to PBS anymore. Do y'all still watch PBS? Wait, get Let into me the know. Baby. That Aretha Franklin did on PBS. Okay, they asked her two questions. The two questions, girl. Why do I would never ask Riri this? I would never ask her this. But anyway, they asked her about a romantic life, right? And Riri, you know, even though she got Willie Wilkinson sitting right there at her side, but they said that Willie Wilkinson was not insecure. He ain't care. Okay, he ain't care about none of this you know, romantic boo s that she was telling everybody about. Oh, I want my sweet prince. Ah, ah, ah. He was just right there because he knew that she was fucking lying. But anyway, Aretha Franklin had told the interviewer, hey, interviewer, okay, when it comes down to my romantic life, I'm still looking for a man that's man enough for me, okay? Then the interviewer went on to talk about her songs. One thing Aretha Franklin has never done was own up to the fact that her music was very seductive. That dad going giving him something he can feel, girl. Oh my God, girl! It would give you the feeling even if you don't want it. You know, like Usher, Seduction. You know them songs that you be sitting there minding your business, and then next minute you know the 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 thing come on and you be like, "Ooh, I'm in the mood, child." That's what her songs like Dr. Feel Good, Do Right Man, them songs, they were all sexually suggestive. 
But Aretha was like, oh no, that's not what my song's about, Riri. Your songs is about some man Ding you down, baby. That's what the songs be back, Ding you down. First of all, the song, uh, one of her songs was the Dr. Feel Good, talking about, no, 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 was it Do Right Man? Something like that. One of her songs was like, I act right for you, but you need to do me right in the bedroom at night. I don't know what Riri. So in November, 1988, the family suffered a great loss with the passing of Big Mama. Rachel Franklin, mother of Reverend, Reverend C.L. Franklin at 91. Ooh, Big Mama lived a long, beautiful life. My grandmother died about 96, at 96. So long, beautiful life. But you know it affected the family, okay? Because basically Big Mama raised everybody's children, basically, until she probably couldn't no more. OK, but after Big Mama's funeral, Aretha had to decide whether to fulfill her contract with Trump's castle in Atlantic City. Why are we talk about Trump? Reeves, why of all things that you make sure that you do is old Trump thing. OK, now I haven't seen pictures with you and Trump. OK, and believe me, Riri, Trump wanted to grab oh, you oh, and another Riri escapade. OK, so here we are in 1989. Mm -hmm. Ruth Bowman said that uh, Riri, again, is not good with self-reflection, okay? Because, you know, she don't like to be completely honest, even if people can see her. You know we can see you, Riri. You know we see you, Riri, okay? But anyway, Riri decided to do a memoir, okay? I'm ready to do a memoir, okay? So she had this one girl to come to her, and she felt comfortable with the one girl, okay? But then she said, uh-uh. Let me do this. Um, excuse me. Let's do an auction on my information. All right. Let's do an auction on what I have to offer to the world, which was a damn lie or some kind of embellishment or fairy tale anyway. Right. So you got all these different people bidding to be uh, the person to do Aretha Franklin's book. Mm -hmm. So the girl who she initially started working with won. Riri said, uh, okay, uh, yeah, you're the winner now? Okay, I need 350000 on top of that. The girl was like, Riri, it don't work like that. Riri said, I he don't sent Riri a letter trying to tell Riri, please don't do this to me. I won. You can't add on $350,000 after the price that I already paid. You can't do that. Riri said, I can do whatever I want to do. And never called the girl again. The girl probably was in tears, crying, shaking in the corner. So, part of 1989 was her throwing that lady in the trick bag over a book that she wasn't going to do or be truthful in any damn way. Another part of 1989, Aretha returned to the studio with the help of Martin. I'm sorry, Aretha Martin and Naranda Walden. Narada, I need to figure out how to say his name. They put together another something for everyone album, okay? And of course, Clive came up with the idea that, okay, we're going to do some duets. Three. Ow. One was going to be with Whitney to Houston. Another one's going to be with Elton John. And another one was going to be with James. There Dewey. was all sorts of drama between Whitney and Reed, said Ruth Bowman, until it nearly fell apart. Aretha kept calling it a mismatch. She said that Whitney lacked her wisdom and maturity as a recording artist. But I just think Aretha was nervous about being outsung by someone from the next generation. It hardly mattered because the song was forgettable. The year after it was out, even the most devoted fans of Aretha and Whitney Houston had forgotten the shit had ever happened. That's her words, not my words, okay? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the song. Do y'all know the song? I Aretha the enters song. the room as Queen Aretha, the original diva, okay? Now, at that time, Whitney was the biggest music star in the world and didn't realize that Aretha felt that she had something to prove to her because Whitney is looking at her like Aunt Riri, okay? I keep telling y'all, now y'all know, Riri ain't Whitney Houston's god mammy, ain't Whitney Houston's auntie, she ain't even Whitney Houston's friend. All they are is label mates, that's it. And if you ask Aretha, Aretha still probably act like she don't know who the hell to Now Whitney is. was acting like an excited puppy dog just seeing her master, okay? Aretha was like a boxer staring down her opponent. 
Of course, the song was about two women competing for the same man, so Aretha was clearly in character. I hope somebody sent Whitney Houston a message, girl. Uh, she, Whitney was probably oblivious. She don't know what the heck is going on. She will find out what the heck is going on eventually, right? So when it came to the track, you know, the song with, or the duet with Whitney Houston and Aretha, okay? Aretha came in for work, okay? She didn't pay any attention to Whitney, even though Whitney was sitting there looking at her with stars in her eyes like, oh, my Aunt Ree. Answer no, that's not your Aunt Ree. Not today. Maybe when you was three, but not today. Okay, or seven, however old she was when her mother, Sissy Houston, was in the studio uh, singing backgrounds for Whitney, I mean, for Aretha Franklin. I don't know, right? But Aretha Franklin was so serious and so into character in regards to uh, her being a whole diva. And Whitney, you know, I don't care who you in charge of or what kind of musical sensation you are. I'm the queen. Don't forget that. In fact, Aretha Franklin said that she acknowledged that she was so much of an ass to Whitney that she felt bad, okay? And she had called Ruth Bowman and was like, ooh, Ruth, you think I should apologize? Ruth Bowman said, do what you feel. But Ruth Bowman said that she don't know whether or not Aretha Franklin called Whitney Houston to apologize for acting an ass that day during that studio session. Now, Rhett again said he don't think that there was no apologies done. Because between Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston, oh, it was a cold diva storm between those two. They ain't even acknowledge each other. Now, we know Riri got the propensity to act like a person is invisible, you know. But Whitney, on the other hand, she the Leo. You know, she's fun going. She's, you know, hey, hey, I love you. I love you. Riri ain't like that. So when Whitney freezes over, then we know we got a problem. Riri really hurt with John. Now we know that Elton John, he could cough on a record and he'll make money because you know the white folks about it. Right? On December 26, 1989, Cecil died from lung cancer. He was 49. Death is a hard topic for Riri. At any time, any publishing asks her about her sibling's death, she immediately breaks down, grabs the paper and tissue and is in, con oh, Tiago grabs the paper and the tissue, grabs the tissue and becomes inconsolable. So, Cecil was all things to Aretha. He was her filter between her and the world. And without him or her father, things in her life got worse. She became horribly unmanageable, okay? Because you know, Cecil was like the voice of reason to her. Okay, Re, you're doing too much, okay? You're doing too much. Now, she already do what she want to do. Okay, whether her brother say, why are you standing people up like that, Riri? Why you do that? That ain't right. That ain't right. Uh, didn't matter. If it didn't matter, then it really didn't matter. So now. I made it a point to call Aretha, said Luther Vandross, because I knew how close she was to Cecil, and I wanted to express my sympathy. But Riri was lunching. Okay? She got in her mind, because, oh my God. She got in her mind that Luther Vandross was just calling to, you know, pick with her, okay? Luther Vandross is like, what are you talking about? I'm just calling to express my sympathy. what I tell you? The way that Aretha deals with things is to be horrifically petty. She snapped out and all the pain and anger that she was feeling on the inside, she lashed out on Luther, you know? That's why her and Luther go through these back and forths in their relationship. It's a love hate type thing, you know? Luther said that she was kirking, okay? And he was like, bam, I ain't got time for this. Uh, uh, goodbye, Bree. He bam. Said before, Aretha you loves to throw a party. The planning takes her mind off of whatever it is that's ailing her. It's like her therapy. So in the late 80s, photographer Paul Natkin was assigned by InStyle Magazine to cover a Christmas party that Aretha was hosting at the Bloomfield Hill. He had home. told the magazine that she was going to be cooking the food herself, child. And it was going to be, who was going to be there? The Detroit Pistons basketball team and the Temptations was going to be there. Girl, you know, we would be lying, okay? What actually happened when the photographer arrived, it wasn't nobody there. None of the peoples that she said was there because the Detroit Pistons was actually playing 
the LA Lakers. Okay. How the hell are you gonna be at Riri Party? But you playing the LA Lakers. So we knew that was a damn lie. How the Detroit Pistons gonna say answer yes during the season? Okay. Now here we are. It's now 1989 was a bad year for Bree. Okay. But the 1990s proved to be different, starting with Bill Clinton. You know, he loves him some Aretha Franklin. And you know, Aretha Franklin is a uh, strong Democratic supporter. Okay, so every time Clinton called her to say, hey, Re, we need you to sing down here at the inauguration or the White House, she was right there. So that gave her third, fourth, fifth, eighth win. You know, so that puts her back into the forefront. And we all know that Re has very strong political and views. the 1990s also proved to be good for Aretha because although her reputation for canceling at the last minute was terrible, she still got big checks for the tours or the venues or the you know dates that she did end up going to. Now, the next move was for her to get back into the studio. She contacted Arif Martin. He was excited to get back to the studio to work with her again. There was no problem. Now, she brought in the music that she was working on. Arif was like, I don't know, I don't know, because remember I had told you earlier that Aretha's music and Carlin's music had become dated. Now, Arif, being an old easy going dude himself, he was like, you know what? I ain't even gonna worry about it. You know, he tried to tell her, you sure you wanna do this, Free? You sure you wanna use your music? You know, you there's a lot of producers out there that you didn't piss off yet. You know, so maybe you can use their music. Aretha said, answer no, because remember, I told you, Aretha knows as long as her songs are on the album, she will definitely get paid, okay? But Arif said, fuck it then. You know, I ain't gonna argue with her. Ain't nobody got time for Riri to be mad at them because Arif knew that as soon as Clive heard the music, he was gonna say, answer no, halt, answer no. Don't bring this 70s shit in here to the 90s. Oh, oh my gosh. Riri stunt, okay? So it's time to make the album. Of course, because Riri, you know, is so spoiled, you got to do things on her time, on her turf. The producer said that when they showed up to the studio, because Aretha does have a studio in her living room, it works, right? But they showed up, okay? Riri was in her robe and bonnet, okay? She came through with a cigarette hanging out her mouth like this, all right? All right, y'all, I ain't got all day with this. Uh, Irma, is that chicken ready yet? Literally. The producer said that she was uh, waiting on her chicken to be, get finished fried. Okay? Is the Kool-Aid yet? Is the Kool-Aid done? Don't forget the, so the season. Okay? Don't forget that. You know? So the producer's like, oh, shit. She not playing with us. So we got to get as much as we can from her before this chicken is fried up. Because that's what they felt, okay? She was aloof. She didn't bring any soul to it. No emotions, nothing, right? But they had to work with whatever they had. And you better believe as soon as that chicken was done, Riri said, oh, okay, all right, my chicken done. Okay, all right. All right, uh, get the fuck out that's of my what house. They said. That's what the producer said. That when the chicken was done, they had to go. Times Magazine, I think it was the New York Times, has said that uh, the song that Aretha Franklin did with Michael McDonald, actually, they said that it sounded like a Whitney Houston reject song. Oh, no. So if Riri didn't hate Whitney Houston before, oh, she really hate her now. So okay. in the winter of 1990, mm, 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 press reports about the Mahalia Jackson, Jackson fiasco began to appear. A jet, always jet. Always Jet headline headline read: New York magistrate rules Aretha should pay two hundred and thirty thousand for backing out on a play. Producer producer Ashton Spring was quoted as saying that the show had been scheduled to open in Cleveland in July nineteen eighty four, but never got off the ground because Miss Franklin failed to appear at rehearsals for the musical. Remember, her daddy died. Remember? So I guess she was just like, I don't want to do it no August 13, 1990, during a freak windstorm, Curtis Mayfield 
was struck by a light tower at an outdoor concert at Wingate Field in Brooklyn, leaving him paralyzed from the waist down. Do you know I forgot that uh, Curtis Mayfield was paralyzed? I forgot okay. that. The new year began on a happy note in January 1991. Wayne State University in Detroit gave Aretha an a honorary doctorate degree. Now, Riri, I wouldn't take that too, you know, too seriously. Okay, them honorary degrees, you know, the school get mad at you. They take that shit back. You do know that, right? You know, Bill Cosby got like a hundred honorary degrees. Okay, and I think they didn't took all of them back. So, you know, I don't know, Riri. I mean, I know she glad that she got it because she was actually the only uh, Franklin child that did not get a college degree, but I wouldn't take them honorary degrees. You know, degrees. But March 1991, Reverend James Cleveland died in Los Angeles at the age. It was a lonely time for Aretha Franklin's. Her friends, her families, her associates, her colleagues, and mentors were all dying around her. But despite her public relationship with Willie Wilkinson, she called Jet Magazine. In fact, the August 19th cover story on Aretha declared that Aretha Franklin, who says she's ripe. For romance is wealthy, willing, and waiting for Mr. Wright, who will not take advantage of her. Uh, Bree, you got Willie Wilkinson right there. Why don't you have a pro why what's wrong with Willie Wilkinson, girl? What's wrong with him? You know, is it because he won't, you know, steal your pus? Is that what the problem is? Girl, I do not understand women. But if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And shout out to Moon Man back, Baco back home in the DMV. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves, you babies, please have a Good one. Peace.